Ah, from the lowest to the highest, from the furthest to the nearest, from the smallest of the smallest to the greatest of the greatest, yoga is about all of life, everything we do, all of existence. My name is James Bogue. Welcome to the Whole Life Yoga Podcast. Today I'm in Vevey, Switzerland at Casa Vinyasa Yoga Center, also known as Ashtanga Yoga Vevey. And it's such a privilege to share in a yoga school that really has this beautiful ethos and demonstrates or embodies so many of the essential principles of yoga. Here in Vevey, this is the culmination. I've been teaching on the road for several weeks now. And as I've been moving around, it's been such a joy and privilege to be in the presence of some of my beloved colleagues and teachers, people I've been collaborating with in some instances for much more than a decade. People like Boris Georgiev, who runs the Ganesha Centrum in Vienna, Thomas Manzanero Alonso, Shankarachal in Ibiza, and Judy Farrell, who, has, who started and directs Merchant City Yoga in Glasgow. And then here in Vevey, Delara Tiv, who I've met more recently. But what all of these collaborators have that I find so inspiring is that they incarnate an ethos of yoga. When one steps into their teaching space, there is a certain palpable energy. And they are really doing this work of teaching yoga as vocation, as calling. And in conversation with these very esteemed and dear colleagues in recent weeks, certain themes have come up in different places. And one of those themes is that me and myself included and my teaching colleagues who we've been teaching from 20 years or more, we have noticed that in recent years, there seems to be in society in general, a strange false belief that has emerged that one can attain something of value in a short time without a lot of commitment or long-term sustained investigation through several cycles of experience. And it's prompted me to suggest or come to the recognition that in the world today, genuine mastery is much rarer than it was maybe not that long ago. Perhaps in the 19th century, I grew up in England, for example, one could find a master carpenter in most towns. One could find a master blacksmith in most towns. One could find people who really knew how to work with the herbs and the plants to create medicinal tinctures, for example, to help preserve foods during the seasons. People had mastery on many of the things that are intrinsic to a healthy life. And that mastery was developed through childhood and through a period of apprenticeship. And this principle of apprenticeship or apprentizaje in Spanish, I was in Spain recently, I've been speaking Spanish a lot in recent weeks. This idea of being a lifelong student is so intrinsic to the yoga method. What does it mean to practice yoga? It basically means to be a student and to cultivate this attitude of lifelong, ongoing, deepening inquiry. The very first word of the Yoga Sutra, Atta, it means now, and now. And now I know that I do not know. Now I have realized that I am not in yoga. I am now qualified to actually do something to invite a deeper experience of yoga. Once I acknowledge that I am a bit torn, I am a bit fragmented, I do have tendencies, patterns that get in my own way, that impede my feeling and experiencing life the way I might like to. And I could do something about it if I made steady, sensible, sustained efforts to get out of my own way. And that's the practice of yoga. Here in Vevey, Switzerland, it's this, the town is situated on Lake Geneva and it's so beautiful. And the lake is very clear. Now this morning, I had the privilege to be able to go and walk alongside this lake and I noticed how crystal clear it was. And I looked into the lake. Yesterday, I actually got in the lake. It's still rather cold. <laughs> but when I looked into the lake, the water's so clear and it was relatively flat, I could see deep down to the depths. It wasn't particularly deep, but I could see down to the bottom of the lake. But I didn't have an uninterrupted view down to the bottom because there were a couple of empty cans, there was some trash down there. 
And this is what happens when we look into the lake of our psychic reality, and that is the practice of yoga. Ordinarily, our minds, the field of our psyche, it's very busy. It's like if I go to the lake and the surface of the lake is very perturbed. And if the surface of the lake is very perturbed, even if the water is clear, like it is here at Veve, I'm not going to see very deep because of that perturbation on the surface is going to interfere with the perception of the depth. It's going to keep me very busy at the surface level. And so when I start practicing yoga, what do I do? I work with mechanisms, techniques that invite all the different layers of my awareness to kind of coalesce and harmonize and settle and come into cohesion, into a balanced, steady, dynamically equipoised state. And in that state, the lenses of my psychic field will become more settled, clearer, so I'll be able to see more deeply. So I go to the lake, and now the surface has become calm. I look into the field of my psychic reality, look into that lake, and what do I see? Well, I see my reflection. I see how I really am. Or I see more, perhaps, than I've seen before, including, perhaps, things that I would have preferred not to see. But once seen, I cannot unsee. And so yoga practice is the means, the practical structure and mechanism to steadily work through all of the trash, all of the detritus that has accumulated through all these layers of our psyche so we can actually fathom our true depths and bring forth the amazing treasure and beauty that is always resident within us as human beings. Because as human beings, we are capable of so much beauty. Of course, we are capable of destruction, we are capable of horrific things. Deep in the depths, there's all sorts of horror, but there's all sorts of beauty. And so the practice of yoga, yoga means balancing, harmonizing, is to fathom the depths. When we look into that psychic lake, as well as the trash between the surface and the depths, we might also see that there's a big sub-aqua cave network. And in the caves down there are lurking all sorts of monsters. They're guarding amazing, beautiful treasure. And sometimes in their caves, as well as treasure, these monsters, they are hoarding maidens. Now, what is it with the monsters who live in the caves of our psyche with the maidens? Why have they got a maiden in there? Well, one suggestion is that the maiden symbolizes the human being who carries a tremendous gift, the depth and potency of which she does not yet know. The maiden carries within her the gift to womb it. In other words, to bring forth something so beautiful, so amazing, from within the existing structure, without destroying that structure, without tearing it down, only really enhancing it. And as human beings, we have this capacity to womb it to bring forth things more beautiful than we would perhaps ever have dared dream from within what already is, without having to rip it to pieces. Instead, by inviting all the different parts that already are to cohere and work together in new ways that are more harmonious, that are more positively creative, working pragmatically, realistically with our own nature. This is what yoga is all about. But in order to do that, this is not the affair of a 10-class punch card or a weekend workshop. This is a long-term engagement. This is a long-term process. The definition of yoga practice in the Yoga Sutra is so beautiful. Abhyasa is the Sanskrit word for practice, yoga practice. How is it? It is an effort Yatna is the word that Patanjali uses in the Yoga Sutra. It is an effort, stitao, for the sake of stiti, for the sake of steadiness. Yoga practice is the effort to foster steadiness. And furthermore, satu, dirgakala, it is a long-term effort. Nairantarya, uninterrupted. Sadkara, attended to with genuine presence. Asevitaha, and a spirit of dedication and devotion. Dridabhumihi then it will become well-rooted. It will become robust so it can actually grow and blossom and bring forth the amazing riches and fruit that is waiting inside to blossom. But this process is long-term, wholehearted, dedicated, committed, attended to with genuine presence and a spirit of enthusiasm, dedication, devotion. So over these last 
couple of months as I've been seeing a lot of my dear friends and colleagues, some of whom I've not seen for a few years because of various interruptions in travel. We've, we all, this topic came up again and again, is that in the world we live in, sometimes things like social media can give this impression that, oh, you can just, you know, I want to learn something, so I'll just take, you know, I'll just watch a YouTube video and then I know about it. Well, you might know about it, but you won't know it. In yoga, in the Indic tradition, there's a big difference between knowing about and knowing. And jnana, no, knowledge, in the yoga tradition, it always means embodied understanding. There is the jnana, which means just knowing the theory, but that's just one wing of the birth. The other wing is the vijnana, the experiential understanding. And that's what it means to really know something. For example, when I studied the Bhagavad Gita with one of my Sanskrit teachers, Dr. M. A. Alwar in, Sanskrit, in, in Mysore, his father, the late great Lakshmitadacharya, told me, he says, James, it's very good that you are studying the Bhagavad Gita, but you must study it Indian style, traditional style. You must study it so you install the book into the very fiber of your being so you can give the book away because it's already in you. That's knowing it, not knowing about it, but installing it into the fabric of your being. And that's what yoga practice is. So yoga practice, by its very nature, is it's designed to accompany us on the whole journey of life. Because yoga is not just mastery of a single art or craft or discipline. Yoga seeks to invite us into mastery of what it means to be human. So this is not a one week, two weekend, 200 hour affair. This is a lifelong journey and commitment, but it's one that's tremendously rewarding. So here I am in Vevey at Casa Vinyasa, Ashtanga Yoga Vevey, presided over, directed by Delara Tiv. Now Delara is a super inspiring teacher. She was born in Iran, grew up in Canada, and she became a professional flamenco dancer in Spain. What does that take? That takes long-term, wholehearted, genuine commitment, spirit of dedication and devotion. So she gained mastery in this amazing expressive art of flamenco as a dancer. So she is eminently qualified to be an extraordinary guide for the practice of yoga because she's already apprenticed herself to apprenticeship because flamenco is a lifelong journey of education. And so when Dalara subsequently became a rolfer and an Ashtanga yoga teacher, this principle of apprentisaje is informing all of her work. And this is the same, I find, with so many of my dear friends and colleagues. There is this spirit of lifelong studentship, of craft, of application, of exploration, of inquiry. Excuse me, there's lots of blossom about today. It takes time, but nothing beautiful comes like that. The real beauty in life is well worth working for. And this is one of the beautiful things about the yogic method. It's a self-propelling practice once we really enter the process. But entry to the process takes longer than the honeymoon period. When people start yoga, often it's because there is something in our life that we would like to change. I often say when I'm sharing on this theme, there's only two reasons people start yoga. Of course, there's 10,000 reasons, but two reasons we're gonna boil it down, pain, desire. Something is troubling us and we would like it to be different. Something is a pain and we have the desire that it would change. Initially, often that thing that's troubling us, it's something that we're very aware of at the surface level of our awareness that we want to be free from. Perhaps it's some pain somewhere in the body, perhaps it's some negative behavioral pattern, maybe at work the boss behaves in a certain way and always triggers us and we feel terrible and we, you know, we go home feeling stressed. We want to change that. We start practicing yoga. And that thing that we wanted to change at the surface level of our awareness, we were very clear we wanted to change it, it changes. How do we feel about yoga? Oh, yoga, I love you. Oh, I'm so glad I found you. I will always cherish you. I'll always hold you dear. And so we're motivated to keep practicing. But as we harmonize that pain in the body, that tendency in our behavior that wasn't really serving us, our bodily system, our mental system, our emotional system, the field of our psychic reality in its deep, extraordinary intelligence recognizes, aha, fantastic, we are now in the harmonization game. And now in the harmonization game, what will the system do? In its deep innate wisdom, it will now bring to the surface the next thing that is ready to be harmonized.
except now this is not perhaps that superficial pain that's just so obvious and we want to get rid of it now the thing that emerges is perhaps something that's been hiding out in one of those caves in the depths of our psychic field or lake and we would really prefer not to have to look at that thank you very much but now now it's been seen and once it's been seen it cannot be unseen so once yoga practice begins to gather momentum we will encounter these periods where we feel a bit stuck we come into some sense of plateau we feel like oh it's not really working anymore but maybe it actually is working superbly well for example when i started to meditate my teacher relayed a teaching to me that was very very significant and you know sometimes when we're meditating we'll have these meditations where we go to sit and we dive inside and everything's serene and clear and we have a rather blissful experience so we have some sensation of clarity or tremendous insight or we may have some experience that's just beyond what we've ever experienced before we might think that's a wonderful meditation <laughs> and we might think we want to have repeat that and of course if we go to sit next time with the expectation of repeating this previously experienced experience of course we're setting ourselves up for disappointment and failure and that very expe expectation will block the emergence of the spontaneous experience of beauty that can only emerge when we meet the unfolding moment with a freshness with a vitality with a certain type of innocence with a certain quality of the apprentice of the person who is a student of life and existence but I had the experience one of my students at the time we were studying the yoga sutra and in this person's life many difficult things all happened at once as Claudius says in Shakespeare's Hamlet, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. And how true this is. And many times in my own life, I've had these types of experience. One goes through a season where many, many difficult things all happen together. And at such moments in life, it can feel like techniques are no longer working. For example, one goes to sit to meditate, and instead of the mind and the mental field becoming clear, and still and tranquil and opening up to some vastness of experience instead we feel it just cannot calm down it cannot there's just so much noise so many things to try and process and my teacher said to me he said in those times when you keep practicing when you keep making the effort to come back to the center even when the awareness is all over the place even when the prarabdha karma, the karma that's been built up and we have to work on in this incarnation is cascading in and we're having to work through all sorts of challenges, if during those periods we can keep inviting ourselves back to the center again and again, patiently, good-humoredly, that is actually the deepest practice of all. Deeper than those blissful times. Those blissful times have fortified and harmonized the system to be able to be to deal more effectively more efficiently more serenely with bigger challenges and when we take on the adventure of yoga practice what are we asking for we are asking to come to wholeness we are asking to realize our true potential our true self our true capacity and that generally speaking means we're going to have to harmonize. We're going to have to integrate. We have to work with obstacles that we perhaps have been implicit in erecting in, on our own path. We've got in our own way. We have to get out of our own way. But the work to do that is a long-term discipline. And so while with my friends, we were kind of observing with some sense of sadness the lack of awareness of what it takes to begin to even approach some degree of mastery just in a single discipline never mind in yoga which is about becoming a master of oneself at the same time i feel tremendously encouraged because everywhere i go as has been the case for at least two decades i meet people who are in their own magnificent humble ways walking a path towards genuine self-mastery who are embodying these timeless principles 
of apprenticeship, of recognizing that as long as we're alive, we have tremendous opportunities to keep learning, to keep growing, to keep discovering. And as my late great teacher, Lakshmitadacharya, often said, and, and incarnated, the expansive capacities of a human life do not end one, when one exits adolescence or one passes the age of 30. No, no, no. The human being can keep learning all life long as long as we keep cultivating that attitude of studentship, of apprenticeship, of inquiry, and of engagement, of commitment. If we make that genuine, wholehearted, dedicated effort to foster steadiness, to observe the field of our experience and invite it into deeper harmony, with commitment, with humility, with patience, with good humor, then cycle after cycle, year on year, decade on decade, this yoga practice can be so tremendously rewarding. And so if you've listened this far, I would just encourage you, whatever method of practice you're working with, maybe there's the opportunity to integrate it that little bit more fully into life. Maybe the opportunities that yoga offer, they're waiting for you to embrace them more fully. And I'm tremendously heartened that in so many parts of the world now, one can work with really dedicated students of the yoga path. People who can invite us into a community of exploration and satsang where we can work together to fathom the depths of who we really are.